Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm surely delighted to see you here in such uh, large numbers. When I became provost of the University of Chicago, it fell to me to worry about one of the country's most famous buildings, Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby House. Roby House was in need of much attention, and the university did not have the resources to attend to those needs aggressively. Given its and Wright's importance in American architectural history, I thought it should not be too difficult to get donors interested. Was I ever wrong? <laughs> Lip service to Wright's stature was by no means matched by support for the Wright heritage. By the time I left Chicago for Stanford, I was quite discouraged, though I had obtained funding for a study of the state of Roby House and what it would take to restore this greatest example of prairie architecture. I was so ignorant about Stanford that with admittedly some sense of relief, <laughs> I indulged the thought that I would never again have the privilege <laughs> to worry about a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Little did I know. I was not only privileged to succeed to $150 million worth of earthquake damage to the Olmsted, Coolidge, and Bakewell Brown quadrangles, but to a hexagonal Frank Lloyd Wright masterpiece, indeed, for all practical purposes, a whole Wright campus quaintly dubbed a house. Hannah House. And Paul Turner soon made it clear to me that Hannah House was as important to California and the West as Roby House is to Illinois and the Midwest. This is the reason we are gathered together tonight. Stanford architecture has greatness, and in the post-World War II period, much mundaneness. Hannah House is greatness that we must restore and preserve, and then we may celebrate. As you know all too well, when I came from Chicago, many people were worried that I would introduce radical Chicago concepts to Stanford, <laughs> such as doing without Division I football. Perish the thought. What I have brought from Chicago is design competitions for new buildings. So far, these competitions have led to the engagement of Antoine Predock, of Jim Polchek, of Jim Fried, of Ricardo de Goretta, and most recently of Sir Norman Foster for important Stanford projects. I appreciate the knowledge and support that David Newman, the university architect, has contributed to this endeavor. In 1937, the Hannas retained one of the centuries and the world's greatest architects for their home that later they donated to the university. I hope we will honor their sense for great architecture at Stanford by making the restoration of Hannah House possible. Our speaker tonight will be Paul Turner. Paul is the Paul and Phyllis Waters Professor of Art. Paul has been a member of our faculty since 1971. I have personally been an avid student of two of his books, one about the design of Stanford University, the other on campus designs more generally. His book on Le Corbusier has been translated into French, and his forthcoming book is on Joseph Ramé. We are very much indebted, that is, Stanford is very much indebted to Paul for his dedication to Hannah House. 
Paul. Thank you, dear heart. On October 17, 1989, the earthquake, now called the Loma Prieta, struck the San Francisco Bay Area, causing damage here at Stanford that the university is still repairing. The most seriously damaged structures were Memorial Church, seen here on the right in restoration, the older section of Green Library on the left, The museum, a little hard to see in this dark slide, but there are cracks there, it's the uh, repairing of which is currently being uh, planned and undertaken. And one other building whose fate has received less attention, at least here at Stanford. The Hannah House on Frenchman's Road, shown here after the quake and in better days, here the same view of the living room before the earthquake. Designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in 1936 and built by Professor Paul Hanna and his wife Jean, who lived in the house until they gave it to the university in 1975, after which it was used as the residence of the provost until the earthquake when it had to be closed. The relative neglect of the Hannah House by the university since the earthquake is perhaps understandable in view of its more peripheral place at Stanford, peripheral both uh, physically and programmatically. But the Hannah House and its preservation deserve our attention, mainly because of its great architectural significance. In this talk, I will try to explain this significance as I see it, and I'll survey the history of the house. Then toward the end, I'll describe the damage it suffered in the earthquake and summarize the plans for its restoration and future use. Well, why is the Hannah House important enough to warrant our efforts to save it and to justify the claims which are often made that it's one of the masterpieces of American architecture? To attempt to answer this, I have to start with Frank Lloyd Wright himself and his contributions to modern architecture. We see him here in his studio in Wisconsin with some of his apprentices and assistants at just the time the Hannah House was being constructed. And I can actually point out a couple of the apprentices who, um, who worked on the project with Wright. John Howe here and William Wesley Peters here, who was also uh, Wright's uh, son-in-law. Another apprentice who we know assisted in the um, Hannah House design was Cornelia Brierly, though she doesn't happen to um, appear in this photograph. Well, Frank Lloyd Wright has become a kind of mythic figure, universally, universally acknowledged as America's greatest architect, perhaps the greatest architect of the modern period anywhere in the world, and the creator of powerful works which themselves have become icons in the public mind, such as the Roby House to which um, uh, President Casper uh, referred in Chicago, built in 1909. Falling Water, the Kaufman House in western Pennsylvania, of about the same time as the Hannah House and the Guggenheim Museum in New York of the 1950s, just before Wright's death. But let me try to go beyond the myth and to define the importance of Wright's work, especially those aspects of it that are relevant to the Hannah House. And this takes us back to the Prairie House the type of building that Wright created starting about 1900 in the Chicago area and which had a transforming effect on much of American architecture. Here we see one of these prairie houses, the Willits House of 1902. Wright at this time was experimenting with lots of ideas having to do with new architectural forms, 
the natural use of building materials, the extension of architecture into the surrounding landscape, and other innovations, which he collectively called organic architecture. But I want to focus on one central aspect of this revolution of rights, a new attitude towards space in architecture, which has been described as breaking open the box or destroying the box of conventional architecture. Wright did this by means of various devices, such as opening up large areas of external wall with groups of doors or windows banked together, windows that often went right up to the underside of the overhanging roof, as we see on the left in this detail of the uh, Willits house. So that space seems to flow between the interior and exterior of the house. Wright also devised new ways of, re of relating the interior spaces to each other, more complex and dynamic than traditional rooms. And let me try to illustrate this in a rudimentary way by comparing two floor plans, one by Wright on the left for a small house, also of 1902, and the other by a fashionable East Coast architect of a few years earlier. At first, they look almost the same. But we can see that Wright has done something unusual. If we trace the, the boundaries of two of the rooms, the living room and the dining room, well, what room does this space belong to here? Both rooms? Neither? There's an ambiguity or tension here and a suggestion of transition or movement. Also, a diagonal axis is implied, a kind of hint of Wright's later interest in non-rectangular design, as we'll see in the Hannah House. Well, this is just a very simple example of a new approach that Wright was soon developing in much more complex ways, and not just two-dimensionally in the floor plan, but three-dimensionally, with ceilings of different heights and shapes, and light that comes in from different angles, from below or above, all traits later found in the Hannah House, as we'll see. Here on the right, we see the Coonley House outside Chicago of 1907, and Wright's own house, Taliesin, in Wisconsin, begun in the teens. Wright seems to have had several different motives for these innovations. First, on an aesthetic level, a desire simply to create dynamic, interpenetrating forms and spaces, a kind of parallel maybe to the cubist experiments of about the same time in Europe, but also ideological or social motives, the desire to invent a new American architecture appropriate to the vitality of the American experience and a response to new patterns of middle-class life, especially the new suburban life for which Wright was creating domestic spaces that reflected and perhaps encouraged less formal relationships between family members, between spheres of living, and between indoor and outdoor activity. All of these things contributed to the great success of Wright's architectural revolution, a success seen not only in the buildings he designed, but in his influence on other architects and on ordinary building of all kinds as his ideas gradually filtered down, especially when in the 1920s and 30s, Wright purposely adapted his principles for more modest types of domestic architecture. Here, one of these Usonian houses, as Wright called them. This one, the Jacobs House in Madison, Wisconsin. And these works helped shape much American suburban architecture even including the so-called ranch-style architecture, or certainly the Eichler houses here in the Bay Area. All of this would have been enough to establish Wright's primacy in modern American architecture. But he went on to other important innovations in the course of his amazingly long career. He continued to work until his death in 1959 at the age of 92. Probably the most significant of these new directions was Wright's application of his spatial concepts to a new realm, that of non-rectangular geometry, as a further development of that desire 
to destroy the box and create dynamic space. Beginning in the 1920s, Wright explored this idea in many projects using geometries based on triangles, circles, and other non-rectangular forms. Here we see a design for a kindergarten in Los Angeles of 1923. But none of these projects was built as a permanent structure until the Hannah House. Designed in 1936 and built the following year, the Hannah House was Wright's first constructed design with a totally non-rectangular plan, in this case based on a hexagon. And in the, in the floor plan on the left, we see this hexagonal grid. I hope this is clear enough for you to see. We'll see some other plans where it's perhaps more uh, uh, evident. Uh, and all of the, um, the parts of the plan, the walls and other elements, such as the, main, the, main, the fireplace in the center, are all controlled by this hexagonal geometry, as you can see. The Hannah House thus inaugurated a new period of Wright's career of buildings using unconventional geometries and taking his spatial principles to their logical extremes, a period which produced many of Wright's most famous and striking works, such as Taliesin West in Arizona, the buildings at Florida Southern College, the Price Tower in Oklahoma, and the Guggenheim Museum. The Hannah House, therefore, while perhaps not one of Wright's most spectacular works, and certainly not one of his largest houses, is recognized by architects and historians as one of his most important buildings. For example, the American Institute of Architects has included the Hannah House on its list of Wright's buildings most worthy of preservation. It's a list of 17 buildings, which is actually a very elite group considering the hundreds of works that Wright built over his career. Also, when the uh, Society of Architectural Historians held its annual meeting in San Francisco several years ago, and I led one of the tours which featured the Hannah House, this was the most popular and oversubscribed tour and not because of my abilities as a tour leader, my fellow architectural historians simply wanted to visit the Hannah House more than any other Northern California building. Well, now let's just look at this house, its floor plan and some views of it for a kind of spatial orientation before uh, proceeding. In this plan, the um, the house itself is, is here. It shows more of the, the property than that previous plan showed. And it's also, of course, rotated uh, 30, uh, 30 degrees. The other plan went up this way, as you uh, remember. But we still see this, the hexagonal grid. And uh, the view on the right is the house from the, uh, the road. I should point out that, the, uh, that it, basically it's a small house. Although, as often with Wright's works, it tends to seem bigger than it is, partly because of the way it extends into its uh, surroundings. You may have noticed, if you remember that other plan, that there are some differences between the rooms in this plan and that previous plan I showed. That's because the house was changed in its, during its history. I'll be explaining this a little later. This is the plan we're seeing here is the present plan, the way it's been in recent years, the other plan was the, the plan at the beginning of, the, of its history. But as I say, I'll get back to that and explain that. The um, a view of the house from the road on the right is taken from down here. The road is, 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 uh, is below in this plan. And as we approach the house, walking up the hill to the left of the house, we're taken first to the side, up, up here along the side. We're looking at the house from over here now. and then to the back of the house, where the entrance is. This is typical of Wright. One does not 
usually uh, enter directly in a straight line, but is taken around to experience the architecture from different angles and to move through different spaces even before entering the house. We pass under a roof connected to uh, the carport, and the entrance to the house is almost hidden. It's actually in here. This is an old photograph, by the way, taken uh, shortly after the house was uh, constructed. Once inside, we find ourselves in a um, space that's quite small but very high and lit mainly by windows at the top. And I should point out that the, uh, the entrance to the house is here, and this is the foyer or entrance area that we're seeing on the, on the right related to the plan. Then to move into the living room, we have to pass through a very different kind of space with a low ceiling, and that's this this space here, the ceiling is dropped down and we walk through here. This is actually, this is very low, maybe um, six feet, nine inches or something like that. Six, six four, I'm told. Uh, very lower than I even remembered. Um, and let me just show another view of this. You can get a little better sense of this space. There it is with that, uh, that low ceiling that one passes uh, under to get into the uh, living room. Sometimes when I've been in the house with students, some of them have said that they feel a bit uncomfortable here in this rather constricted space. But I think this was intentional by Wright. He wanted us to experience in a very physical, bodily way different kinds of spaces, even if some of them make us feel pressed in or confined. Because then we can experience a sense of liberation when we move into the next space. Here, the living room, where the ceiling soars up at an angle and the space moves out and through the glass walls to the landscape beyond. But at the same time, our attention is drawn in a circle around the central fireplace. This is the fireplace and on the plan, here it is, the, the hearth, so we're in this, this space. So we're drawn around the central fireplace, which acts as a kind of hub for this spatial movement or choreography. And here another view of the, of the fireplace. Unfortunately, like most complex architecture, these spaces cannot be appreciated fully in photographs, even in movies, really. They have to be experienced in person. But we can try with these slides. And I think you can perhaps sense how the hexagonal geometry of the floor plan, with no right-angled corners anywhere in the house, contributes to this spatial fluidity and movement. Then we continue around toward the dining room, and here the architecture changes again. This is another early photograph we're seeing. The floor rises a couple of steps right uh, there, and that's here. Here are the, those steps, it's actually more, it's th three or four steps in the uh, plan. And the space gets rather dark, as you can see. Wright constantly manipulates the level and quality of light in his uh, buildings just as he manipulates the spaces themselves. Then the dining room itself, where things open out again. I must admit here uh, that um, personally I've never cared much for the fact that carpeting covered most of the floor for uh, uh, many years. I personally prefer seeing the hexagonal grid of the concrete slab itself, or at least uh, much of this uh, uh, grid, and maybe if I'm go back, we see in this very early photograph before there was carpeting in the, in the house that uh, one sees this, uh, this hexagonal grid in the, that's, that's in the uh, concrete slab of the floor. In any case, continuing this circular movement through the house, the bedroom and the study are beyond here in the, um, in the plan. And um, We'll see, uh, and then the, and we'll see them later. And in the center is the kitchen, with its own distinctive spatial character, narrow and high, and lit from above. And I'll have more to say about the, the kitchen. You're having a typical response to this kitchen, which uh, I'll, I'll I'll talk about later. While we're still on this uh, tour of the house, I should point out that the design, as with most of Wright's works, is not just the building itself but the whole environment. 
For example, the hexagonal geometry in this case extends out from the house, controlling such elements as retaining walls, subsidiary structures, and uh, landscape forms. And the house is intimately tied into its natural surroundings by its relationship to the topography, its views, and its accommodation even of specific features of the site, such as the old oaks and other trees, which uh, Wright carefully designed the house around. Here a view of, on the left, a view of the bedroom end of the house. And there's actually a notch that Wright created in this roof for that oak tree to fit uh, into. Well, how was it that such an important and unprecedented work of Frank Lloyd Wright was constructed here at Stanford? This brings us to the Hannas. Paul and Jean Hanna, who were among Wright's most perceptive and sympathetic clients. Here we see them with their children at the house just as it was completed in late 1937. And I thank the Hanna family for providing me with this uh, photograph. They came to Stanford in 1935 when Paul Hanna was hired as an associate professor in the School of Education in the field of childhood education. And they immediately asked Wright to design a house for them here. But their relationship with the architect went back several years earlier when, as a young couple beginning their careers at Columbia University in New York, they had been thinking about the house they hoped someday to build, had done a lot of reading about contemporary architecture, had been captivated by the ideas of Frank Lloyd Wright, had written to him, and then in 1931 had actually visited him at Taliesin, his home and studio in Wisconsin. to discuss uh, his principles of domestic architecture. Their relationship with Wright had developed in the following years, and he had actually visited them in their small apartment in New York during two of his business trips there. So Wright knew the Hannas well when they finally asked him to design a house for them at Stanford. And I think that Wright's decision to use them as guinea pigs, we might say, in an experiment to build a revolutionary design was due to his knowledge of these two young people, their enthusiasm, their idealism, their willingness to innovate, and more specifically, their ideas about education and the importance of environment in the life of a family. And I should note that this uh, idea has been examined in an article on the Hannah House to which I'm indebted by one of my former graduate students, Richard Jonkis. Also, I think that Wright probably saw the Hannas as an especially modern couple, both of them well-educated and working together as a team. They collaborated, for example, on, on publications, something which would have appealed to Wright's progressive outlook, especially at this time in his career. But to get back to the story, Wright began producing various plans for the Hannas in late 1935 and came to visit them here at Stanford in early 36 to examine the building sites that they were trying to acquire on university land. In July of 1936, they secured their preferred site, shown here, the hilly property on what's now Frenchman's Road. And Wright adapted for it the hexagonal plan that he had already been uh, proposing to them and which they had been struggling over, first being puzzled by it completely, but then becoming increasingly enthusiastic. Here we see one of the site plans and a perspective drawing by Wright that he did a little later when the plan was uh, finally uh, settled. Well, the next several months were a period of intense communication between Wright and the Hannas both in person and through correspondence, as the plans for the house were refined. And throughout this process, the Hannas were extremely active participants in the design, constantly asking questions, making suggestions, 
and sometimes insisting on certain points. Here, let me just show one more uh, plan. This is the, the final plan that they came up with, and another drawing by uh, Wright on the right-hand side. Probably the most important element of the design that resulted from this interaction between architect and client was the idea of creating a house that would change as the needs of the family changed. This notion of flexibility over time was put into effect more fully here than in any of Wright's previous works, and it was due mainly to the Hannas themselves. They later recalled, quote, we asked for a house that would be comfortably livable for a family of five, father, mother, and three children, but also a house that could be altered to suit us when the children flew off to their own nests. To our wonder and delight, Mr. Wright was able to achieve this. I'll describe these alterations a, a little more in more detail a bit later, but let me just point out the main ones while we have uh, this original floor plan on the screen. The um, uh, children's playroom was turned into the dining room afterwards when it was altered after the children uh, left the family. Uh, and you remember that's where the, um, uh, the, the dining room is now in, in, the, in those pictures that we uh, saw earlier. The, um, also, the uh, children's bedrooms were uh, transformed into a large uh, master bedroom, and the um, old master bedroom and study were turned into a large uh, library, and we'll see these um, later. I should point out that the original dining area was, was down here. By the way, I should also mention that the, um, that the Hannes documented, probably more, than, probably more than any other of Wright's clients, the entire history of the project. Every communication of theirs with the architect, all phases of the construction of the house, its subsequent changes and later dealings with Wright himself. And when they eventually gave the house to the university, they also gave this archive of documentation correspondence, drawings, photographs, and other records, which are now in the Special Collections Department of the Library. And this, of course, only increases the historical value of the house. Some of this documentation is also recorded in the book that the Hannas later wrote about the house, published in 1981, which is fascinating and sometimes amusing reading with its detailed and honest account of both the ecstasy and the agony of working with a great architect and of executing a revolutionary design, including the day-to-day -day crises, financial conflicts, and other problems. And speaking of the financial side of the story, I should point out that this was essentially a low-budget project. The Hannah's original budget for the house was the amazing sum for us today of only $15,000. And although, although they ended up spending, or rather borrowing, more than this to get the house they wanted, they were still clients of quite modest resources, certainly in comparison with most of the other clients of Wright's famous houses. And I mention this partly to point out that the unusual amount of attention that Wright himself devoted to this job, including numerous visits to Stanford before, during, and after construction of the house, was clearly motivated not by the pro uh, prospect of a large commission or the prestige of creating a lavish house, but simply by the challenge of experimentation and of working with stimulating clients. Well, construction of a house took nearly the entire year of 1937. Here are some of the photographs that the Hannas took themselves and are now in the uh, archives here at Stanford. The construction involved so many unconventional procedures that no contractor could be found to take on the job. So the Hannas themselves assumed part of this role, hiring the various craftsmen and supervising the work with the assistance of a local builder who became interested in the job, a man named Harold Turner, no relation of mine. And the, the Hannas even pitched in with the work themselves, the physical work, 
which naturally just increased Wright's admiration for these adventurous young clients. The most unusual aspect of the construction was, of course, the hexagonal module on which everything was built. The puzzled workmen were told to put away their carpenter's squares and were given specially constructed 120 degree angle irons with which to lay out the grid pattern of the concrete floor slab. On this hexagonal grid, the walls were then erected, rather like um, folding Japanese screens, which in turn supported the outer parts of the roof, supported inside by the uh, central brick uh, uh, chimney mass. Here we see this uh, screen-like effect in the finished house uh, in one of the uh, walls of glass. Also unconventional was the design of the solid wooden walls of the house, composed of a thin sandwich of three boards. Here we see a, a cross-section drawing, maybe a little hard to see, through this um, uh, uh, typical wall. Red wood on both sides, the whole thing only two and three quarters inches thick, and exactly the same inside and outside the house. One of the local um, newspaper stories that announced this uh, talk last week said that the reported that the Hannah House is unusual because its walls are very thick. It's amazing how many mistakes are said about the, uh, about the house. Don't know where people get these ideas. Perhaps uh, partly because of the unfamiliarity and strangeness of the house to people that it's uh, more uh, mistaken facts are uh, said about the house than, than most. Not surprisingly, the building began to attract attention while still under construction. Here we see a brief article that appeared in the magazine Architect and Engineer in August 1937, which, by the way, also got some facts wrong about the house, but I won't bother to point those out. But once the, um, the building was completed, the media attention really began. Much of the information provided by Wright himself, who now considered this to be one of his most innovative works. In January of 1938, the magazine Architectural Forum devoted several pages to the house, including commentary by Wright. He called it a new venture into space concepts. And he wrote, I am convinced that a cross section of honeycomb has more fertility and flexibility where human movement is concerned than the square. He liked this uh, honeycomb analogy and uh, later often referred, referred to the building as Honeycomb House. The obtuse angle is more suited to human to and fro than the right angle, he wrote. And it would lead to livelier domesticity. And we see here that connection that Wright made between architectural form and social patterns. He also said, appreciative clients, not afraid that they were going to be made ridiculous, were essential to this experiment. Without the help of Paul and Jean Hanna, nothing could have happened. In July of 1938, a more substantial article in the House appeared in Architectural Record. In a uh, supplementary issue devoted to Wright, on the cover of which was a photograph showing the architect sitting at the uh, fireplace of the newly completed house. And here we see a, um, just a blown up detail of that. And I think this must have been the visit that Wright made in April of uh, 1938, when in fact he brought a, uh, a large group of his apprentices to see the house. He was obviously extremely proud of it. Uh, additional uh, commentary by Wright is printed in this um, article in Architectural Record, but much of the text was written by the Hannas themselves. And they're quoted. Uh, for example, they, they wrote, and I'll show some uh, images um, from this uh, article as I'm quoting them. They said, we are learning to live by new patterns. The most noticeable change is the lessening of tension, the increased sense of repose. Traffic flows naturally from one part of the house to another. On the terraces, we eat two and often three meals daily. The living room, they wrote, is a part of everything else. It seems to flow on in rhythmic beauty. 
They described how the children's spaces worked. For example, how the playroom and its outside terrace become one huge play area when the dividing wall of glass is rolled back, as we see in the, the upper part of this uh, slide here. And Jean Hanna described the unusual kitchen, or laboratory, as Wright had named it on the original uh, uh, plans, on the original floor plans. This was apparently the first time that Wright used this term laboratory for a kitchen, and I think it must reflect his notion of this house as a kind of social experiment and of the uh, Hannas as social scientists. Jean Hanna wrote in this article, Swinging doors admit us to the laboratory, precisely in the center of the house. Here I am not isolated from the family. I can look through fins into the dining room, through other fins into the playroom, and on through the glass walls to the hills. I'll match the view from my laboratory with anyone's. And she noted that the extra high ceiling keeps the laboratory cool and odorless. And here we see a later section drawing uh, th uh, cut through the, uh, this part of the house showing the system that Wright devised for ventilating this interior space. I myself recall that when the uh, Hannas would show the house to visitors, the most common doubts people expressed were about this uh, kitchen. But Jean always defended it uh, vigorously. Well, I want to uh, mention one other early article that discussed the house because it was written by an architectural historian and critic, Talbot Hamlin, who could be expected perhaps to be more objective about a building than the architect or the clients. And in fact, Hamlin did make some criticisms of the Hannah House, which are um, worth noting, I think. He wrote, the question is, what has been gained by a plan of 60 and 120 degree angles? He discussed this and said, the result is complicated instead of simple and clear. And he continued, the matter of furniture is even more serious. There are chairs which look awkward and uncomfortable. And Wright had, in fact, designed uh, several different types of, uh, of chairs for the house, designed especially for the Hannah House uh, based on hexagons. We see one of these uh, types of chairs that he uh, produced these uh, at the dining table, that original dining table uh, that was uh, in between the living room and what's now the um, uh, dining room. And in fact, the Hannahs later replaced some of these chairs, which were attractive, I think, but had the unfortunate tendency to tip over. <laughs> also, um, Hamlin added in this article of his, he said, the making of a hexagonal bed offers difficulties. <laughs> And the Hannahs later uh, altered these beds also. But then Hamlin wrote, yet the house is beautiful and poetic. There is a character of variety, of change, of invitation around corners that is endlessly fascinating. And above all, there is an extraordinary rhythm. The whole house sings. One merely wonders, he concluded, whether it has been gained at too great a sacrifice. Now, one could challenge the criticisms made by Hamlin, but his observations help explain, I think, why the Hannah House, despite its tremendous appeal, its beauty, and the great publicity it achieved, has not had much practical influence on architecture in general. After all, there aren't many other houses using the hexagonal module. The design, perhaps, is such an extreme expression of Wright's principles, especially the destruction of the box and of a dynamic flowing space, that it may be unsuited as a prototype for building, as many of Wright's other designs were suited. What makes the Hannah House great may also limit it as an architectural model. In this sense, it might be seen as more of a work of art than as a completely practical design. But the Hannas themselves probably would not have agreed with this view of mine. 
To them, the house was perfect in all ways, and their love of it only increased with time. Twenty-five years after the house was built, an entire issue of the magazine House Beautiful was devoted to it, with articles on various aspects of the building, including an article on the Hannas themselves. And again, Paul and Jean contributed much of the text to, for the magazine, for the other articles, not the article in themselves. They loved writing about the house just as they loved showing it to people, students and the many others who came from all over the world to see it. When I began teaching at Stanford and the Hannahs still lived in the house, I was a beneficiary of this generosity of theirs. I and the students in my architectural history classes, whom I often took to the house, uh, and the Hannahs always found time for us. Also, I should mention that over the years, large numbers of Stanford students have been inspired by exper their experience of the Hannah House. Some inspired to study architecture, others to enrich their work and lives in various ways through the experience. And it really amazes me how many former Stanford students tell me that the house strongly affected them in, this wa in these ways. By the way, if any of you have had similar uh, reactions or experiences to the Hannah House. I'd be grateful to uh, hear from you. Well, by the uh, time of the House Beautiful issue in 1963, the building had undergone the main changes that had been planned from the beginning, and these were described in the magazine. The transformation of the children's playroom, seen again on the left here, into a large dining room, seen on the right. The three small children's bedrooms at the top in this um, slide turned into a master bedroom suite. And the old master bedroom uh, and study turned into a large uh, study or library seen on the um, uh, bottom in that slide on the right. And I think I have another view of this library, the new library. By the way, these uh, transformations were carried out by Aaron Green, a, for, a former Taliesin apprentice and Wright's West Coast representative, who was recommended by Wright himself for this uh, job for the Hannas. Also, another uh, transformation or ad uh, addition to the uh, house that had happened actually a little earlier by Wright himself uh, was uh, construction of the separate uh, structure originally intended as a guest house and which um, Wright um, uh, redesigned around 1950 to include um, uh, guest quarters and also a studio for crafts activities, which the Hannahs called the uh, Hobby House. And other miscellaneous additions made over the years, such as the waterfall fountain or cascade of here flowing down toward the house, and here we see it from the, from the other direction, this cascade in the garden which, uh, besides being attractive, the hand is put to uh, an ingenious use. Quote, we are awakened at 6.30 every morning by the sound of this waterfall, which an electric clock has activated. <laughs> and they added, this cascade was Mr. Wright's answer to our wistful expressions of admiration for falling water. <laughs> by this time, the Hannahs were already thinking about what would happen to their house after they were gone. And they discussed this briefly in the House Beautiful issue. They mentioned that the president of Stanford, Ray Lyman Wilbur at that time, had uh, jokingly threatened to turn the house into the faculty club. <laughs> but, um, but they were hoping that the building could be used, quote, as a teaching facility and research center for the arts dedicated to education in the arts and architecture, and also as a memorial to Frank Lloyd Wright and his principles. Here we just see uh, two more views, draw, Wright's drawing and uh, a view of the house. Later, however, when the Hannas discussed their plans with the university authorities, they were told that the house should remain a residence. And then they conceived the idea that it would be, that it, uh, be used 
to house a visiting distinguished professor each year. In the late 1960s, the Hannas began the legal transference of the house to the university, and in 1975, they moved out. In their typical careful planning, they wanted to do all of this while they were still in charge and could see the plan through, though it surely must have been painful for them to leave the house they loved so dearly. I later visited them several times in their new apartment in the Pierce Mitchell housing complex down the street, but I could never bring myself to ask them how they felt about the move, and they always were, were cheerful as usual when I saw them. The Hannas were upset, however, when the university decided to use the house as the provost's residence instead of carrying out their visiting professor idea, and they were rather vocal about it. At one point, Paul Hanna asked me for my opinion about this, and I responded very frankly to him. This was in an exchange of letters, which I still have. I told Paul that I thought there were potential problems with anyone living in the house other than themselves if the main goal was to preserve it and make it accessible to the public. And I, saw, thought that, and, I, and I said that I thought the idea of visiting professors living there was actually more problematic than the provost living there, since visiting professors would be constantly changing, might have no interest in the house or sense of responsibility toward the university, and even one disastrous visitor could do grave harm to the building. After all, it's rather um, fragile in certain ways and has to be handled with care. For example, uh, it's natural redwood surfaces, which can easily be stained or damaged. Also, since it's essentially a small house, it's um, really suitable for only some kinds of families. Now, all of this, of course, has some relevance to the question of how to use the house now once it's restored, which I'll return to um, in a bit. But on a different note, uh, I also suggested to Paul Hanna and to Stanford um, uh, administrators at various times that perhaps the only really appropriate residence for, uh, resident for the house would be the, um, aside from the Hannas themselves, would be the uh, Stanford faculty member who teaches architectural history. <laughs> uh, un unfortunately, this proposal never seemed to generate a great deal of support. From, uh, from 1977 until the earthquake, four Stanford provosts occupied the house. The building was frequently used for university functions, and it was open periodically for uh, public tours, though naturally on a more limited basis than uh, when the Hannas had lived there. In 1987, Jean Hanna died, and the next year, Paul. So they were spared wis witnessing the effects of the earthquake on the house. Before describing these effects, I might uh, just mention that when the earthquake occurred in the late afternoon of uh, ac October 17th, uh, 1989, the house was occupied by two members of the family of the provost and the longtime housekeeper. This lady has told me that first there was a loud noise, like a bomb exploding. Then the house began shaking, objects falling, and doors opening by themselves, and she exited fast, she told me. Well, what damage did the um, house suffer? The main visible effects were the following. The collapse of part of one of the retaining walls, which supported uh, a terrace, not the house itself. The settling of parts of the floor slab, especially in the living room. And we can see um, here the, uh, the edges of some of these uh, hexagonal uh, um, blocks which uh, rose and fell. Various cracks and, and shifts. And probably most serious, movement of the uh, central brick fireplace mass, a twisting movement, which crushed and displaced some of the bricks. Down here, at, especially at this part, and I have a, a detailed view of that part of the uh, fireplace mass. In addition, and not visible, some of the members of the roof structure shifted a bit, especially where they're supported at the top of the fireplace mass. <coughs> 
Then there's the question, what were the causes of the damage? Always a more difficult question in uh, dealing with earthquakes. I should first say that the damage was evidently not caused by the presence of a minor fault line that crosses part of the property, a fact that's been played up in some of the journalistic uh, stories uh, on the house since the quake. Nor apparently was the damage due to any problem in the overall basic form of the house, that is its underlying concept of design. But certain details of the design and of the construction of the house did contribute to the damage. For example, when the hillside was graded, that is cut and filled, to create a level surface for the floor slab, the soil in the part that was filled was apparently not uh, compacted as well as it should have been. And that, in the, looking at the plan of the house, it's, that's this area here, especially in the, so it's mainly the living room where, the, uh, where there was this problem having to do with the underlying soil uh, conditions. Also, the brick fireplace was built of unreinforced masonry, that is, with no steel reinforcing or reinforced concrete. And there was insufficient connection between the roof structure and the fireplace mass. Uh, these were pretty standard building practices, construction practices, when the house was uh, built in the 1930s, though now we uh, know better. So what needs to be done to correct the damage to the house? This has been the subject of careful analysis since the earthquake by both experts within the university and consultants brought in from outside. And the story of this process, which I can only summarize briefly here, demonstrates that seismic engineering and building repair are not as straightforward as one may assume, especially when dealing with unusual or historic structures. Here, let me just show uh, some more views of the house uh, uh, to look at while I'm talking about this. One basic question is the degree to which a building should be strengthened against future earthquakes. We might imagine that a building should be made to withstand any conceivable earthquake with no damage. But this is an unrealistic standard for any building, and especially for an historic building like the Hanna House. Since, since very high standards of strength may require the total rebuilding of much of the structure, you uh, might end up with a very strong building, but it would not be the uh, original building. It would be a, a, a new structure. So restoration of this sort nearly always involves the weighing of conflicting factors, some of them rather subjective, and compromises. The first engineering solution that was devised for the Hanna House about uh, four years ago used a high standard of structural strength as a given and entailed quite a lot of demolition and rebuilding. For example, the central fireplace mass would have been removed completely and rebuilt in reinforced concrete with a brick veneer. A later alternative scheme involved um, somewhat less demolition but provided strength with new steel members at various places in the house, some of which would have had to be visible, uh, clearly not an ideal solution. The final plan, developed by the engineering firm of Rutherford and Shakin, makes certain compromises and employs some ingenious methods to uh, provide the necessary strengthening. For example, the uh, central fireplace mass will be preserved, but vertical cores will be drilled in it, then filled with concrete and steel reinforcing and connected with the roof uh, structure above and the wooden walls of the house will be strengthened from within, despite their extreme thinness. And really, the only major part of the house to be replaced is the buckled floor slab in the living room, which will be recreated after correcting the soil conditions underneath it and adding what are called grade beams uh, under the slab to tie the uh, exterior retaining walls to the uh, fireplace mass. The basic principle of this plan is to preserve intact as much of the original fabric of the building as possible by finding ways to get behind it or under it to strengthen the structure. FEMA, the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency, which has been contributing to the repair of the earthquake damaged uh, buildings at Stanford, has endorsed this plan for the, for the Hanna House and has made an initial verbal commitment to provide $600,000 toward its repair. 
The total cost of the project to restore the house and ensure its uh, future preservation and maintenance is estimated to be about $2 million. About, uh, nearly half of this has already been obtained or committed, mainly the uh, FEMA grant and uh, an endowment from the Nissan Corporation. So a fundraising campaign for about $1 million has uh, recently begun. The overall restoration effort has been planned by the Hannah House Board of Governors, which I've been chairing. And finally, let me say something about this board and about the plans for the future use of the building. When the Hannah House was originally given to the university, the Board of Governors was established by the President to oversee the use and maintenance of the house. After the earthquake, the board was not convened for some time, and finally David Newman and I asked President Casper to reconstitute it, which he did, with a new membership representing the kinds of experience and input we felt were needed to plan the restoration. Besides the university architect, David Newman, and architectural historian, uh, myself, the uh, board includes representatives of the uh, Stanford Historical Society, the University Archives, the Hannah House docents, the volunteers who led the guided tours of the uh, house for many years until it was closed, the University Facilities Office, Development Office, and Committee on Land and Building Development. In addition, we've brought in numerous experts from outside, structural engineers, architectural preservationists, and others. And we've called on a member of the Hanna family who has attended nearly all of our meetings. Besides the structural repair uh, of the house, the main issue we've had to deal with is its uh, future use. And this has involved lots of, of discussion, consultation with experts, and study of the ways that other historic houses are used, especially those owned by uh, universities. Although some details of the future use have not uh, yet been decided, the basic principles have been determined and approved by uh, President Casper. These are that the house should not be used as a permanent residence, that it should be made as accessible as possible to students and the public, and used for educational purposes, classes and seminars, as well as guided tours of the house, and for various kinds of other university functions, as long as these activities do not endanger the preservation of the building. Foremost in our minds has been our responsibility as, cu as custodians of this uniquely important architectural work, to preserve it for continuing generations of students and others to enjoy and be inspired by. The Hannah House, in my view, is indeed one of the masterpieces of American architecture, not only because of its great beauty, but because of its uh, central importance in the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. First, as the pioneering project that inaugurated Wright's non-rectangular buildings. And also as perhaps the best example of Wright's creative working relationship with sympathetic clients. As a result, the Hannah House is the classic expression of many of Wright's design principles, such as the creation of dynamic space, the destruction of the box of conventional architecture, and the integration of architecture and nature. In these ways, it epitomizes the creative power of America's most innovative architect. Thank you. <laughs>